Hi everyone, it's Joakim Makren here. Today I'm going to be talking about company culture in gaming. What is that all about? First, a word from our sponsor. This lecture is brought to you by the city of Oulu in northern Finland. Uh, invest in Oulu. They're the hottest business and the coolest city you could ever imagine. So they're located in the northern parts of Finland. They're the number one R&D investment location in Finland among the top in the EU. 35% of the people in all have a university degree and 38 years is the average age of the people of Oulu. They're the youngest in Europe. They're the fastest growing city in the Arctic. They're, they grew 15% in the population in the last 10 years. The Oulu is the center of investment, so they're really growing big in the commercial, logistics, and the culture region. So they they really have a really cool investment scene there where in the in the last uh, five years and they're the kind of projections for the following five years looks like we're gonna hit 200 billion euros invested into that region of arctic europe uh, the olu is the third most venture capital in europe per capita so 15 15th on the top 50 cities of vc investment per capital uh, they have 18,500 high-tech jobs 8,000 R&D experts, and the University of Oulu has about 25,000 students. The collaboration is in Finland is very unique. You have the public sector bringing in uh, financing to the companies, but there's also partnerships with the universities on all sorts of projects. The key industries in these areas are the ICT, life science, clean tech, creative industries, which includes gaming, other industries, and trade and logistics. So if you think about the gaming sector in Oulu, they have Fingersoft, which builds hill climb racing. That's the biggest company, but they also have companies like Kokoi, who just uh, partnership with this uh, Zepto Labs to create Omnon Run. And then you have Resistance Games, who are bringing out a company of crime, this strategy game, next summer in 2020. So, and definitely they're the number one in quality of life. I've been to Oulu dozens of times and I love that area. So, to find out more, go to Oulu.com or businessoulu.com. Let's kick it off with an introduction to, to what I do. So my name is Joakim Akren. I'm the founder and CEO of Elite Game Developers. We're a company that's helping gaming entrepreneurs so that they would thrive in building their games companies. I have a podcast called Elite Game Developers Podcast where I interview founders, investors, people who I've met in the industry who think differently who have interesting things to say so check it out it's available on all the different kind of platforms like spotify uh, apple Podcasts, everywhere and then i'm writing a blog on the elite game developers site you can find it under elitegamedevelopers.com slash blog where i try to every week put out an article related to a topic just recently i wrote about how to work with startup advisors in gaming startups. How do you structure kind of the expectations on both sides? How, how you create incentives for the advisor regarding like stock options, uh, things like that. And then the formality of how, like what is the agreement that you put in place between the company and the advisor. Besides the blog, I, I just recently wrote a book called 
long-term game, how to build a video games company. It's available on Amazon and later in 2020, it's going to be available in all sorts of online bookstores. So check it out. And then finally, there's a lot of online courses coming your way from EliteGameDevelopers.com. Currently, we have a few free ones and there's also a course called Pitch Your Games Company, which is meant for founders who are trying to figure out how they should raise funding for their gaming startup. Check out that course uh, and see if, if it's something for yourself. My background in gaming, so I've been an entrepreneur for 15 years. Uh, my first company that I, I started was Iron Star Helsinki in 2005. It's, it was a virtual worlds company doing stuff for Nokia phones. It was very early, very hard to get users back in the day for a mobile product that was an online product as well because people didn't have the data plans. It didn't really work out. We pivoted to, to build Facebook canvas games, became profitable for a while until Facebook closed down all the viral channels. We couldn't really sustain the, the game anymore. And then we closed down the company. I went to Supercell for a while, uh, left in 2013 to start building Next Games, uh, which I la left last year to start Elite Game Developers. So my work with company culture, I've, I've seen a lot of things in my career regarding how that, will, that can work, uh, what kind of mistakes I've done. Mostly in my first games company, there was a lot of mistakes that I made regarding the culture, harnessing it, building a strong culture. But later on in these other companies, for, for instance, at Supercell, I could really see that those people had the experience. They had really studied and thoroughly thought about culture building. And it was a really cool example of how it should be done. And then at Next Games, we started applying a lot of lessons learned since people came from all over the place and wanted to do things better. So today I'm going to be talking about, first off, the 10 tools that I build, uh, believe are essential for building a strong company culture. We're going to start off with trust. It's the number one point. What is trust? So trust is basically cooperation in a, in a sense that there is, you know, People working together in a company that are trying to push things forward with this feeling that everybody wants to cooperate, everybody is in it for the same kind of experience, the same challenges, the same learnings, uh, trying to push something together. Uh, it is very hard. What I've learned through my career is that it's very hard to kind of like say that now we trust each other. <laughs> But it's, it's more about feelings versus this kind of like hard instructions, how you work. So in a sense, the trust can be built through having a overly communicative culture where everything is being communicated from the top uh, to the bottom. And also there's the communication that there is a... Um, a, a good framework in place that there would be communication coming also bottoms up from the, the hierarchy or from the company. So if you think about the definition for a great culture, it is to put the focus on the people and then make sure that they know the context and the why, the purpose for the people to be there at the company. This goes into talking about also the mission and the vision that is there's something shared there between people uh, that they know that they're working towards something together. So the, there's definitely like this, these things that I've seen that usually it's not that evident that where trust can really like be, play a big role in when you want to push the company forward to take it to a more successful level. So I, I I always think about velocity as something that, how do you achieve great velocity in a company? 
well, in a sense that that uh, advantage that a company can have is how quickly they, you know, build stuff. They see if it works or not. They do change. They have a, a a speed to them which is unique. But I, I've seen that if you have a lack of trust between people in a company, that that really creates massive friction for speed and velocity. So, so startups can really eliminate all the edge that they have regarding speed if they don't build trust with each other and with the players of their games. So that needs to be in the DNA of the company from day one. And another way that I've seen things go really wrong is that when when you have you know hard times you there's bad news coming maybe a layoffs of people that really can take trust down to zero easily so it needs to be the communicative culture in hard times is even more important because that can erode trust so easily if there's nothing happening regarding like what is going on in the company. So messaging, all of that is is key. Then we go into to values, the company values. So what are values? They, they're this kind of like, you know, if you go visit somebody, they might have their meeting rooms with their values pointed out as the meeting, meeting room names, or they may, might have them in the wall of the meeting room. Uh, like clearly pointing out that this is this is the the values that we go after as a group of people but they need to be verbs they cannot really be you know something that is too fluffy or something it, they need to be actionable so that people when they see it they immediately means that okay there is a behavior that i can immediately uh, start you know taking into account in my day to day work that really reflects this value. So how, how essential are these values? For for me, when I had a, my first company, games company, Iron Star, I didn't really think that this is something that you know, a startup would need. So a first start founder might not think that the mission that the company is on, the core values that are kind of like create, like that they would be essential but the fact is that people come and go, but the company will stay and the company will become its own entity. Uh, so there's, there's these things that I was talking recently on a culture panel with, with some people and there was Paul from App Annie there. We were talking about culture fit. So Paul highlighted an issue with somebody who didn't fit their company values that maybe they they had like these kind of like killer skills that were really required by the company so the point he was making is that is your culture strong enough to say no to these kind of hires uh it's a really interesting test you know if if the leadership says yeah it's fine we can have these kind of people involved like how does that like regarding your behavior and the values does that really reflect them so and then then I had Callum from Netspeak also on this panel and he 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 admitted that he had let the wrong people stay at his previous companies where he was a manager and that had happened twice where he knew that it was the wrong hire but it took like several several much nine months or something to correct the damage that it did to the culture once they 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 decided to to put out this person, like, you know, lay off the person who, who wasn't really good fit. So in in any case, the permanent changes that you you bring to the company, you, you can't really be happy about those if they were against your values in the first place. So, like, how do you live to the core values? So take your actions in mind, not your words. It's about so much about the actions that you do. You cannot really, again, like with trust, you cannot instruct core values, but they need to show from the leadership to, to the bottom of the company. 
So defining values is important because they provide guidance for these kind of ambiguous moments and scenarios or or tough uh, trade-offs that you need to do. So their their influence on a on a thousand or million daily decisions will take the company forward towards its mission, really. And rituals, number three. You need to create rituals. This is so important. Like this, this is something that at Next Games I started really figuring out. Like, what is this meaning? I, I at Supercell we had this uh, drinking champagne and having a toast when when a game project had been killed and it didn't pass through the soft launch to to become a global launched game. So at that stage, it I didn't really understand the real meaning behind that, but. I've been gradually understanding that it's so much about gratitude is so important, reflection is so important, and also uh, having a ritual in place that is kind of like something that this is what we, this is how we, we react to certain situations in the company. So at Next Games, we had this thing called Kudos, which was an all hands event every Friday where each employee would draw a wrapped candy from a box and then give it to somebody in the company. And when giving the candy to this person, they would they would speak out loud what value of the company this person had represented in their actions and behaviors during the week. Uh, the main idea with kudos was to, to show gratitude. So in a sense, Essentially, like in a startup, when you're small, like there's a few people only in the company, it can take years of hard work to pay off, like to to get somewhere with your games. Uh, even to start paying salaries might take years. So you're gonna be like uh, being this kind of like cockroaches trying to stay alive until you finally start making money. So most leaders understand the value of celebrating the small wins because it's really hard to actually do in practice this thing. So failing to recognize hard work can build up a lot of resentment in the company. I've seen this happen. So allowing yourself and your team to celebrate the small wins on a regular basis can help meet the team's needs for recognition and to to increase a sense of connection between the whole group of people who are putting in the effort. So there was one addition to values and how those can become rituals if you tie it back up to the point number two, which was value. So uh, what we did at Next Games was that we had the the leadership team and the management and the founders of the company do some workshops around the values but then we wanted it to kind of like go back to the company so we went and had workshops with the whole staff regarding the values that we had kind of like brainstorm and idealize in these workshops and before they were finalized we we still went through them in several uh, smaller groups who kind of like distilled and made them more concise and showed them in all hands meetings and it eventually like started really working that uh, once they were kind of like brought bottoms up back towards the leadership getting all the feedback from the teams it was easier to have them in the day-to-day work you could see them in these kind of like product decision making meetings and and one-on-ones and also the kudos so it was all a a really good kind of beneficial factoring towards having rituals in place to 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 strengthen the values and to strengthen the culture so uh in the panel that i was just mentioning previously is that we had sophie wu there and she said that It's more important how we act as a team. So the culture and the rituals are very specific to teams and they don't have to be normalized across the organization. I saw this as well at Next Games that we had 
teams that had really specific cultures of their own ways of operating and showing gratitude and then another team had their own style and I saw it work so well and those people still are they have bonds with each other still nowadays when they might not even be in the same team anymore but they created these bonds that will last for forever through these rituals Number four, action. So it, action could also mean that there's something that you repeat constantly in the company, that there's things that you know you do on a weekly basis. You have an all-hands meeting, you have one-on-ones, you cover the same things there. Things like what is the mission of the company? What is the vision? What are the values? And like early stage of course like all the startups will be focusing on their game and it's so easy to fo- forget that a strong culture needs work needs repetition to start working so what is another definition of a culture well it is what happens when the ceo isn't in the room so you know you have m- modern leaders are enablers facilitators But they also still need to lead by setting an example through action and behavior. So everything you repeatedly do, you can do better if you start iterating them. So here we have a a poster, which was super interesting. I I saw it, I think, on Twitter a few days ago. And it it really like points out these kind of different uh, actions that... Uh, successful people and unsuccessful people do Uh, there's some that are definitely questionable here but i think like you can immediately see like embracing change uh, complimenting forgiving others talking about ideas continuously learning uh, accepting responsibility for failures having a sense of gratitude setting goals and developing life plans like all of these really like reflect that if you're constantly uh, bringing this up in the company for your staff and creating rituals, creating actions like this, they, they will change things to, towards something that feels good and pushes you towards the success. Next up, we go to hiring for culture. Point number five. So hiring for culture, on the panel that we had recently regarding company culture, I had Gwen go there from uh, Singapore. And Gwen talked about the culture fit in hiring, that it's, it isn't always necessary, but she says that when a person comes into the company, they start grooming them to be a nicer person. And you can, they said, she said that, They've seen a lot of this kind of like cultural change happening when hiring people who aren't gamers, for instance, that they're bringing them into gaming and they they start to realize like what kind of like passion industry, the games industry is, that these people can introduce a lot, lot of experimentation techniques also to the company because they're coming out of gaming in into to to the games industry. So it's really like really like creates a different kind of format. Then there's this saying called hiring slow and firing fast. What that, that usually means is that you want to really like spend a lot of time looking at the candidates. There's a interesting rule that I recently read about, which is this, uh, that, hey, if you're looking at the whole hiring timeline that you have, maybe you have one month to hire the person you want or two months, or three months. But then spend at least one third of that time just looking at candidates, not picking any of them. But like more, this is like you're understanding your screening time where you figure out the fit. And then once the one third of the time is out, then when you start bringing in new candidates, you'll immediately know like what you've seen and you've seen what is out there and then it's much more easier and you have a thought process already in mind for hiring so first-time founders might not think 
that for instance the the mission and the, the core values are that essential when thinking about hiring but the fact is that people will come and they can change the company through their own kind of behavior and how they are as people to work with so the the company will start shifting uh, supercell is pretty notorious about this in a recent blog post by miska katkoff he was analyzing supercell on the deconstructor of fun blog and he said that supercell is really notorious on like their hiring process word on the street is that in some years up to half of the new hires were terminated during the first six months uh, which you have to put into perspective considering that supercell hires only the absolute top talent in the world this creates a culture of extreme pressure to deliver uh, demand by ones like peers instead of the management however supercell does not have a toxic culture it's just a culture where you have to hyper deliver all the time or leave it, you can really like structure it in that sense that's where the hiring slow firing fast comes into play and Callum Brighting from NetSpeak on on our panel recently said that I want people to very quickly work out if they belong here or not we're not going to get it right 100% of the time we're going to make a lot of mistakes in our hiring pipeline for sure and I want people uh, that we bring into the company to very quickly be able to work out like ah this is this isn't a place for me i don't feel like i could belong so that's what callum was talking about as this kind of like internal emotion metric that people really feel that they belong point number six surfacing problems what does that mean so first off you definitely need to have a safe environment to talk about problems like this was uh, mentioned as an interesting idea from uh, Ben Horowitz's book on company culture which came out last year in 2019 uh, there he mentions about this kind of like surfacing problems thing that you really want to encourage people to come up and say that there's something you know wrong Maybe it's in the, the game, maybe it's in how things are structured, how things are communicated. But like going back to the safe environment. So one of those things for creating a safe environment is to show uh, that the leadership can feel that there's vulnerability, uh, that vulnerability can happen in the company. And that, that means that you create an environment in which someone... Any, anybody in the company feels safe enough to raise their hand and say that they don't know what they're doing or that hey I have a job but I haven't been trained for it I need help I might have made a mistake uh, or they screwed up they're scared they're worried so all of these things uh, it's very very kind of you need to feel safe to admit this inside the company uh, Otherwise, if there's not this kind of safe environment to point out these kind of things, people start feeling that they cannot talk because they might, you know, get laid off when when a layoff round happens, maybe, or or that you know they're they're thinking about uh, people that they need to let go. Uh, so, if the company like has this kind of like. Uh, culture where every single day everybody can come to work and feel that they don't need to hide and fake things that's already a great place to start surfacing problems and then to address them point number seven uh, pact so what i'm talking about with the pact here is that it is this kind of like you have a employment agreement with the company and the employee but there's there's more to that. Uh, there's this book called The Alliance from LinkedIn co-founder uh, Reid Hoffman, where he talks about the thing called a uh, tour of duty. It's it's sort of like a guideline for 
when the person starts at the company, they, is, they plan for two years ahead for like how this person will be trained, what kind of responsibilities they will, will have, what is the person getting, uh, not just financial rewards, there's more to that that the company wants to provide to this person, but also the person will be giving stuff back to the company. So there's a, there's a cooperation going on there. And the tour of duty also like points out that if the person then decides to leave at any point or at the end of the tour of the two years, that the company will back them in anything that they're doing. But of course, they want to kind of like after the two-year duty to do another tour, maybe it's three years, and then plan it again. So there is this thing with bigger companies usually that, you know, they're hiring quickly. They don't really have these kind of guidelines in place. And then the reactions when people, really talented, great people that they were depending on start leaving, the reaction can immediately be very sour and bad. So if you have key people leaving the company, maybe taking their team of people with them to start the new company or going to a competitor. Well, how does the comp big company react? It's usually like, if they're really like uh, what the Alliance book is talking about, the company should be supportive, maybe f giving, you know, seed funding, like a small check for the new company that this, this group of people are, you know, founding versus just, you know, blaming and giving a lot of hatred uh, and like creating like something that lasts forever, like a bad vibe between, you know, individuals in the, the, the old company and this new company. So it, it really depends on, of course, like if the lever is going to react to a competitor and taking more talent with them, then it's, it's of course difficult to deal with. But, but in any case, these kind of guidelines make a lot of sense. And having a pact between the company and the employee will take a lot of hassle away. And, and final point here with the pact is that you really want to like think about these, these people who are the pillars of your community. This was something that Callum was talking on our on a panel recently that you know you have people who are essential for the organization both in process and progress but also for the culture so if these people leave they might take a part of the company in a sense with them when they go away that the company kind of loses something there more than more than just uh talent so a Callum was pointing out that the culture might even fall apart in these situations. So what really helps here is that you definitely want to kind of like take pe these kind of uh, pillars of the community out of silos so that you can grow kind of like other people around them to become also these pillars of the community. So it's not so much about the few individuals in the company who are the outliers who are making you know, the best games that you could have, uh, the most successful games. So, like, broaden it out as soon as possible. Point number eight, top-down and bottoms-up. What am I talking about here? So, uh, this is something that everything that goes through the organization should sort of, like, reflect from the top it goes to the bottom but then there should be a really like interesting process where things then bounce back from the bottom up and this is like welcomed uh, feedback communication uh, understanding that there is actually a communication route that is going up and down the organization so of course there is there is certain things that really have to start from the top and uh, these are things like you know what kind of things are acceptable behavior in the company like what is about the culture what really goes through the values that is that makes sense what is the right way to hire people setting mission and vision but everything needs to go up from the top to the bottom and then come back up point number nine hard times. This is a very interesting topic. And 
uh, I've been thinking about this a lot. Like, if you think about going back to ancient Rome, like a, a, an empire that lasted for hundreds of years, and they they built cool uh, places where people could have a lot of fun because there was an abundance of wealth in the empire. You had the Colosseum where they had gladiator fights. Uh, so the Roman Empire spent loads of money to keep people happy so that they wouldn't complain, <laughs> in a sense. But like, then it started crumbling when, when you know, this abundance and the wealth couldn't keep up with like the expansion of the empire and tribes started invading and things got really hard for the empire How, what kind of lessons can you learn from there because i think like similar instances can be seen when wealthy companies create happiness by spending money it's like you know fancy office perks off sites in the caribbean think about those things like when the hard times hit can be a really shock for the whole group of people who have had this lifestyle of being really high on you know the jet set life and suddenly it's tough uh, one example now is uh, with the, the coronavirus and how airbnb is laying off a lot of people since their revenues are down recently the ceo brian chesky wrote uh, a letter to the whole staff and it was shared publicly on their website so i i took a look at it and there's some interesting things in the structure of this letter i think this is something that companies that start you know going through a situation where they might have had a, a failed game uh, launch and then they need to lay off people so the structure in the Airbnb layoffs message was that they wanted to point out that they've done a lot of preparation and work regarding the changes that will now be happening. And they point out the hard truths of uh, coronavirus and revenues being halved from last year and how they're trying to secure the future by raising additional funding and doing these layoffs. So the layoffs kind of like drop early on in the, the message here. Which, is, which makes sense because they don't want to stall the inevitable. And they're focusing on a new strategy where they go back to their core business for, like it feels like the, ne the whole next decade will ab be about the core business here. It's gonna be a long, hard road and they need to have some reflection on what is the company mission and vision. So appreciation there for all the people leaving, they're pointing out that you know they're gonna have a really good severance pay of at least 14 weeks of pay. Uh, all the equity will be immediately vested. They're gonna help out people find new jobs. And then talking about what's gonna be happening next, like a departure meetings will start for the people who are leaving. Uh, team team meetings will will be happening, but a bit later for people who are staying so that they're taking time now to take care of the people who need to leave. Uh, so things will go back to normal, but it will be harder. Uh, and it's going to be even harder if they don't do the layoffs. That is the, the kind of like ending message here and showing some final appreciation for the people who are leaving. It's really interesting read. I definitely recommend you check it out. And then... There are good examples about these hard times for big companies. Like there's a there's an interesting clip from this YouTube video from uh, Simon Sinek. Let's take a look at it. Charlie Kim, who's the CEO of a company called Next Jump in New York City, a tech company, he makes the point that if you had hard times in your family, would you ever consider laying off one of your children? We would never do it then why do we consider laying off people inside our organization? Charlie implemented a policy of lifetime employment. If you get a job at Next Jump, you cannot get fired for performance issues. In fact, if you have issues, they will coach you and they will give you support, just like we would with one of our children who happens to come home with a C from school. It's the complete opposite. This is the reason so many people have such a visceral 
hatred, discon, sort of anger at some of these banking CEOs with their disproportionate salaries and bonus structures. It's not the numbers. It's that they have violated the very definition of leadership. They have violated this deep-seated social contract. We know that they allowed their people to be sacrificed so that they could protect their own interests, or worse, they sacrificed their people to protect their own interests. And and here's a, another example from the same talk from Simon Sinek. Bob Chapman, who runs a large manufacturing company in the Midwest called Barry Waymiller, in 2008, was hit very hard by the recession, and they lost. 30 percent of their orders overnight. Now, in a large manufacturing company, this is a this is a big deal, and they could no longer afford their la their labor pool. They needed to save 10 million dollars. So, like so many companies today, the board got together and discussed layoffs. And Bob refused. You see, Bob doesn't believe in head counts. Bob believes in heart counts, and it's much more difficult to simply reduce the heart count. And so they came up with a furlough program. Every employee, from secretary to CEO, was required to take four weeks of unpaid vacation. They could take it any time they wanted, and they did not have to take it consecutively. But it was how Bob announced the program that mattered so much. He said, "It's better that we should all suffer a little than any of us should have to suffer a lot." And morale went up. They saved 20 million dollars. And most importantly, as would be expected, when the people feel safe and protected by the leadership in the organization, the natural reaction is to trust and cooperate. And quite spontaneously, nobody expected, people started trading with each other. Those who could afford it more would trade with those who could afford it less. People would take five weeks, so that somebody else only had to take three. Here are uh, the. URLs. I also add them into the YouTube comments, so you can go check these out. The content that I just showed. Final point here: curiosity. What is this? What it's all about? So, I think this is one of those things that any startup should really be considering. That they're they are curious companies. That they're they don't know everything. They really need to spend time. Learning, so uh, it's kind of like saying that that we can all grow more if we put more work into it. So, growing as individuals, uh, I there was a another interesting quote from uh, Simon Sinek who points out that great leaders are like parents. So, uh, what he says is that the closest analogy I can give to what a great leader is is like being a parent. If you think about What being a great parent is, what you do, what what makes a great parent is, we want to give our children opportunities for education, discipline them when necessary, also that they can grow up and achieve more than we could for ourselves. So great leaders want exactly the same thing; they want to provide their people opportunity for education, for discipline when necessary. Uh, Build their self-confidence. Give them opportunity to try and fail, all so that that they could achieve more than what we could ever imagine for ourselves. So that that is how you grow a company, and that's how you build a strong culture, something that cares and trusts. So the feel and the vibe, you'll like see this kind of like end product happening from being. Being a parent who creates these opportunities is that when people visit your company, this is what I ask often on my podcast as a question: like, what kind of experience do you want to give visitors who visit your company? What sort of image and vibe should they walk out with? To summarize the points of today's presentation: number one, trust. You want to build trust through all of the the tools that we talked about here uh, to create trust, because then people will stay, stick around, and build a strong company. Number two, values. They are actionable statements that people can immediately see, and they know what kind of behavior we're talking about here. Rituals, uh, showing gratitude. 
towards people around you. Actions. Taking actions, taking repetitive actions, iterating on what works, what doesn't work, messaging inside the company, uh, being really like reminder of yourself that you need to push, put in this work every week. Number five, hiring for a culture. So looking after like the process of what kind of people you're bringing in, how you make them fit to the company, are they fitting or not? How quickly can you can you uh, fire them if they're not working early on as possible, of course. Number six, surfacing problems, having a, a mechanism in place to talk about issues in the company or things that, you know, are going wrong, but like... It, it really requires this safe environment to be in place where everybody feels safe to talk about things. Number seven, the pact, which I talked about where the employee and the employer uh, create a kind of like a, a relationship-based uh, guidelines of how we, how, what we're getting out of this relationship that we're doing together, like how the company will what the company will get, how the company will grow from this person being in the company, but also vice versa. And then number eight, the top down and bottoms up a culture where uh, all the messages, communication comes from the top down, but then it bounces back upwards so that there's constantly a loop going on there of information, like how everybody is feeling, uh, what is being taught about, what is being said. Uh, number eight, hard times. So uh, when, you know, financial issues come up about like the coronavirus, things like that, where people need to lay off, how do you structure that in a way that everybody still feels safe and that there is a strong culture and people who even leave will still feel that they, they were part of something very strong. And the last point was curiosity to really being uh, fostering uh, a culture of education and learning uh, is very strong. Thinking about like the leaders being parents for a big group of people and like how you're helping them grow. That's it for, for this presentation. If you have any questions, please add them into the comments here. I happily take a lot of them and try to answer them whenever you... Uh, whenever you've posted some. Uh, and please listen to our podcast and, and do subscribe to our newsletters. I'm putting a lot of effort every week to put out something interesting on the newsletter. So sign up to that at EliteGameDevelopers.com. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye.